everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk, give you guys a little bit of an overview of the workshop that we're going to be doing at the conference and tell you what the workshop is going to be about. So the title of the workshop is how to build and integrate AI features into your application. So basically what we're going to do is to show you how you can like say you have an application or you have a use case where you want to use AI. Then how do you kind of go from that goal to a practical reality when they're for which there's an AI service running that is actually going to be able to help you put this kind of intelligence into your application. So that's what we are going to cover at a high level at the workshop. So now why are we you know, interested in looking at this? So what this slide has is each one of these logos is actually a different uh, AI related product offered by just three companies, Google Cloud, AWS, or Azure. And so between the three of them alone, there is at this point more than 130 products in the cloud space just to help you build AI. And so the amount of technologies out there to help people build AI is profound. And there's you know, so many different kinds, and this is just counting these three guys. It doesn't count IBM or SAP or any of the open source out there. You add those and then you have yet more stuff there to help you build. On the other hand, are people building? Not really. You know, there are, is a bunch of adoption and there's some very, very sophisticated adoption out there in pockets. Like if you look at, you know, large web companies or very specialized startup companies, there are people who know how to do this. But to a large extent, most of the you know, enterprise industries out there are still really struggling to figure out how to adopt. And it's not because of the shortage of tools out there. It's simply because, you know, even though the tools are present, it's kind of hard, they're kind of hard to understand how to use and use together. So why is it difficult for people to really kind of get going? The reason is because you have to go through a whole bunch of different steps in order to, you know, actually get an AI, you know, solution trained, deployed, usable, improve it over time, things like that. And so, you know, across the industry, you know, slightly different terms are used often, but to a first extent, there is a workflow and the workflow involves a bunch of different stages. And that workflow has a tendency to be fairly complex to do and, you know, and some stages are better understood by people than others. So here's an example of a typical flow, you know. So you start by defining your use case. or so what is the problem that you're trying to solve? Then you try to figure out, okay, do I have some data for that problem? Do I have to do something to the data to prepare it to be used for AI? And that's usually called data preparation. Sometimes it's called feature engineering, things like that. And once you have a reasonable amount of data or a reasonable quality of data, then you have to actually you know, see how well you can model it and use a bunch of different algorithms, find the right algorithm for you, things like that. Then you have to train that algorithm using you know, whatever are the appropriate parameters in order to you know, get a good algorithm that can predict with reasonable accuracy. Now you have to deploy this algorithm after you're done training it and you've come up with a model that makes sense. Deployment means that now it's actually running somewhere where you can use it to, you know, and integrate it into your application. Then you have to integrate it. And this itself is a challenge because now the, you know, you have to change your application code and figure out sort of if I had to upgrade my model later, if new data comes in, how do I make sure that my application doesn't break, things like that. Once you've got it up and running, you have to monitor it because you know, these algorithms can change in their behavior as data sets change and things like that. And then like all software development processes, this is not a one-time trick. You, know, you have to constantly make everything in this better. So in short, you start about here and then you go through this cycle. And by the time you get to this, you've deployed it once and then you do it again and again and again and again. So some of the reasons why people find it challenging to, you know, um, to actually get going and adopt machine learning or AI or any or deep learning or any of the different techniques is because this flow itself is actually fairly involved. And each one of these stages actually is where, you know, there are tools available, but the ability to use those tools together is a fairly challenging task. So that brings us to what are we doing in this workshop? So the workshop is going to be about three hours long and it's going to be a hands-on workshop. And what it's going to do is, you know, uh, we're going to have, you know, work with people and take them through a typical AI workflow and take them through all of these steps and have them do these steps so that they understand 
how to actually create a workflow like this and actually get it to work. So we'll start by, you know, how do you actually create a deployed AI model from a data set? How do you deploy that model in the cloud? And then how do you integrate that into your application? How do you assess how well it's doing in your application? And things like that. And so that cycle that we showed you before, we're going to go through that cycle, you know, at least once for a couple of different use cases. Uh, hi, Nisha. Once again, can you... Uh Turn your turn on your uh, display screen, like sure. um, full screen. Is this better? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Looks no, better. yeah. Absolutely. So uh, thank you for pointing that out, Lena. So effectively, then the areas that we cover is, you know, if you have data, how do you kind of bring it into the environment? How do you run, create an, a workflow from that data? How do you deploy and test a microservice that you know has a trained model in it? And specifically for application integration, we'll show you how to integrate with a Python application. You, don't, you can integrate in other languages as well, but for the purpose of the workshop, we'll be integrating with Python applications. We'll also show you how to test, you know, independent of your applications to make sure that your AI microservice is working correctly. Now, for the purpose of the workshop, we will be providing sample code and, sorry, this should have said sample data but we will be providing sample data sets and sample code so that everyone can run through an example. So you don't have to bring in any actual you know, data set of yours. Uh, you, you can use some of the sample data sets and the sample code that we will provide. The you know, services that we will be using in the backend will be based upon AWS. And so everything that people will be running will be running you know, on AWS and we will provide, you know, essentially you'll be using some provisioned AWS accounts during the duration of the workshop. Now, if you're already an AWS user and you would like to use your own AWS account, you're welcome to bring that in as well, in which case we'll show you how to, you know, do it on your own AWS account. Um, but if you don't have an AWS account, then that's fine. We will have a template account that you can use for that purpose. Um, there will be some coding involved. Coding will be primarily in Python, but it will be fairly minimal. And you don't need to know any pre-knowledge about AI algorithms. So if you understand algorithms, then that's great. You'll you know, understand a bit better what's going on. But in order to do this, particularly since, as you'll see in the la next slide, we'll be using AutoML very heavily, you don't really have to have any AI pre-knowledge as a requirement. So that we'll run through you know, a couple of use cases, and that's about what can be done within the timing of the workshop. So we'll be doing sentiment analysis with text data, uh, and we'll be providing you know, sample text data sets for this purpose. We'll also be doing recommendations with a combination of text, numerical, and categorical data. Um, there will be a number of built-in algorithms that can be used as you develop the workflows. And there will be a combination of AutoML where you know, we'll be using some cloud AutoML services that for those who don't know what AutoML is, um, it's essentially a series, there are a series of services out there right now where you can provide a problem and then the, the service will actually you know, commission multiple algorithms and it will try out multiple algorithms and tell you how they did and then recommend one. So we'll be using some of those. We'll also provide semi-automated tuning, which means that if you want to go in and change the parameters yourself, you are you know, able to do that. And we'll show you kind of how, depending upon your level of expertise, you can leverage AutoML or you can complement it with your own advanced knowledge of data science. So we'll be handling both of those things. And for both of these use cases, we'll provide a set of different algorithms so that you can see how the data set behaves with different algorithms. So that's all I had. Hopefully this gives you a sense of, you know, what is going to be covered at the workshop. Uh, our intention is for you to come out of this workshop with an understanding of what it means to actually deploy and use AI in a practical sense in your application and ideally be empowered with the information needed in order to get going. Be happy to take it. Is hyper personalization via distillation and amalgamation. Uh, using deep context. So we all know that knowing our customers' preferences and their idiosyncrasies and the things that they like and dislike 
very specifically will help us when we're doing marketing, for example. Take a retail example. You get ads for different things. A lot of them can be irrelevant to you. You will probably respond to those that are more in line with your personal preferences. And this is what hyper-personalization is about. So to personalize the user experience, personalize uh, when you're marketing in a marketing campaign, personalization of content for customers. In order to do that and accomplish that, here in this talk, we introduce two techniques. The first we are calling distillation. Distillation consists of 12 tasks. And uh, I will give you an example of two right now. Uh, and then we'll cover everything in detail in the talk. Uh, as an example, if you, if you receive emails, um, and you may receive hundreds of emails during the day, a distillation of emails would be a summary of who has sent it, what is the priority, what is the sentiment, what are the topics, what are the action items on you that are requested, uh, rather than going through the hundreds of emails. So distillation involves topic modeling using latent Dirichlet allocation, uh, LDA, involves sentiment analysis to describe and understand the severity and urgency of the request coming in. Uh, thirdly, it is the ranking of the customer or developing a formula for a lifetime a value of the customer and incorporating these in conjunction with entity resolution, figuring out who it is that is calling or who it is that we are targeting as a marketing campaign or as a content to be delivered to. So I'm just mentioning these four as an example. There are uh, eight others that we'll cover in detail, and we will show how to utilize these in conjunction to perform distillation as a first stage. Uh, another challenge that we have is solved by the second major technique that we're introducing called amalgamation. In amalgamation, we're essentially enriching the data sets. In many cases, you've seen data science experiments or labs or tutorials or in real life, leverage one data set. Often that data set, when analyzed as a data scientist or machine learning engineer, does not afford high accuracy or good recall. And therefore, uh, we recommend techniques that we're gonna be covering under the banner of amalgamation so that you can amalgamate at least three different data sets and we'll show traditional techniques which everybody is familiar with is the join on a field. That's easy. But then we'll really go into the details of a probabilistic join, how to join features that are not your traditional relational database join and leverage graph databases and other techniques for probabilistic joining of features in different data sets so that you can enrich your overall data set and achieve higher levels of precision, better levels of recall, better AUC under the curve, and in general, better metrics like L1, L2, and other metrics, root mean squared error, et cetera, that are significant either in machine learning or in deep learning. So to do hyper-personalization, we're going to show you how you can do distillation as a set of 12 activities and amalgamation as a set of uh, activities that enrich your data. Combining these two together, we demonstrate how hyper-personalization can enhance the customer experience, provide a market of one, and provide greater relevance, contextually relevant information that's necessary for decision-making which is the prime purpose of using machine learning and data science. Um, and that is generally what's missing in a lot of uh, courses and in a lot of discussions around data science and machine learning is how to practically apply it so that you can actually gain insight into a decision-making process and 
to have a, an aid to decision making from that perspective. Um, in order to do so, we will also uh, be, ho be holding a, an additional workshop, which is separate from this presentation, an introduction to natural language processing. This is a very uh, highly acclaimed one. A lot of people have responded positively to this. And in that, we go through the phases of uh, what natural language processing is using Python and using the Amazon uh, backend services. So with that, I will turn that back over to uh, the organizers. How's that? Yeah. All right, great. So thank you, for, uh, thank you for the opportunity. My name is Minglin Chow, and I am a senior vice president within Wells Fargo Bank. Uh, I lead the um, AI model, the artificial intelligence model development DOE, focusing on unstructured data. So any AI models, uh, machine learning, deep learning, as long as the data source starts with unstructured data, for example, text data, image files, voice data, chat box, all of these come to, comes to me. So that's uh, kind of the background of me. I, I've been with, I have a PhD in uh, econometrics. I've been with Wells Fargo for 13 years. And um, so that's, that's kind of my background. What I, I'm not coming in with any um, pre-sale uh, uh, pre uh, incentives in my conversation or my presentation. Uh, this is a um, high level, a bit of a high to medium level, I would say, conversation around a very, very, um, um, very close topic, closer to my heart, around how to de-risk models, AI models in the banking industry. So um, I'll give you a, a little background. The, I wanted to start with my agenda as some of the, introduce some of the AI model, AI machine learning model applications in Wells Fargo, to talk about the two sides of the AI machine learning models, and then focus on my, my presentation around de-risk AI, why that's needed, what are some of the recommendations, what are the current challenges, and then lastly, focusing on um, introducing some of the current trend in word embeddings in, in natural language processing. So why is, what is AI, why is it important? I'll spend uh, just one minute, less than one minute uh, on this pre-kicking, kicking out a preamble of what AI is, why it's important. Some, some uh, starter uh, teasers around quotes that are generated by AI. Um, and some funny observations that we've seen in that space. We will, and then I will then um, focus on what is AI in the space of um, this concept, right? So AI can be many things, but in, in the context of this presentation, I wanted to narrow down to, to focus on the business benefits that can be realized by um, financial service industries, the AKA the means to leverage uh, natural language processing, and and then leverage machine learning, deep learning. Um, why is AI important to Wells Fargo? Uh, it's the same reason why AI is important to any of the other financial services that have the goal to better serve our customers and communities. There are many things that we can do with AI, leveraging AI, so that the future of banking can provide personalized guidance services to customers, and at the right time, in the it's through the right channel, um, personalized and simple and secure, and then reflecting what the customers are going through at the moment, powered by insight and derived from uh, from data. Um, some of the machine learning examples at Wells Fargo. Uh, this would be. Um, not surprised to many of the users that they personally have experienced things that are empowered by AI, machine learning, in, in within as services rendered um, from uh, their respective financial industry, financial providers. So in the fraud space, I will, I will spend a few minutes around the fraud space, around how to do personalization, leveraging AI, what are some of the operational risk components that AI is able to help uh, address within Wells Fargo? Um, some of the decision making, customer experience improvement, and target marketed targeting, and so on and so forth. Well, I will then move on to what are some of the natural language NLP, natural language processing within Wells Fargo. 
um, conversational in the conversational and guide space around human machine interactions, some of the insights and uh, analytics and monitoring space around sentiment, around categorization and classification, around detections, emerging trends, and then around anomalies and exceptions. And then we, we um, some of the other things that are um, really closely um, being in, invested and developed, such as translations and content generation. Um, the two side of AI. AI has huge opportunities for the banking industry. At the same time, lots of challenges. Cost of AI is is really huge. As our first speaker has alluded to, there is a uh, decent and long life cycle around AI. Um, the modeling component may not require that long time. However, um, each of the pieces, such as how, how do you pre-processing pre the data? How do you have a platform that's able to help you build the model? How do you plan to deploy the model? Where can you do the conversion from you know, model development to model, uh, model deployment? Once you deploy the model, how do you connect to your application end? And then what, what do you do with, with uh, active learning? Uh, what do you do with reinforcement learning? What do you do with iterations that need to happen on a batch mode or near real time? And how do you how do you put together a validation model validation plan that can can address the the improve the, the increased risk associated with AI model development? And how do you loop through this iteration uh, all over and over again? Lots of complexity around that. Um, that's why the cost of generating AI models and leveraging AI models for them to be useful are extremely, extremely high. Uh, AI models uh, heavily depend on data quality and data quantity. Lots require a lot of label data for NLP use cases, uh, which, which isn't readily available in financial industries. There are, there are very, very limited model transparencies and explainabilities, which pose significant risk to the financial industry. Uh, so, so the main topic of my talk would be around how do we de-risk AI machine learning models? Um, AI machine learning models have uh, uh, amplified a lot of the elements of model risk. And the regulators have stipulated that banks are responsible for ensuring risk associated with machine learning models are appropriately managed. This is a this is a big under uh, undertaking. Um, as as I previously mentioned, there was reason why the complexity was was increased dramatically. The size of the data had increased dramatically. The type of the data becomes a, a, a variety in the variety, uh, a huge variety of types of data. The algorithms are you know, never ending, continues to grow. The understanding of those complex algorithms are not clearly documented and articulated. Uh, de design decisions needs to be made prior to the model uh, is built. Sometimes it's not, not, that's not the case. And then uh, the, the investment requirement on new software computing environments is humongous. Around the, the risk AI models, if we're saying, you know, is there a is there a textbook that that has provided uh, solutions to the risk model? The answer is no. There is not a specific uh, specific guide guide guidelines around exactly what you need to do in order to do that. However, there are elements of of model risk management frameworks that are already in place that we can continue to enhance to address these. So the next, the next phase, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the examples of uh, how do we, what are the, the additional risk elements that are um, especially important to the risk AI model, and uh, how do we, what are some of the method, methods and solutions uh, in trying to address those, um, such as model interpretability, such as you know hyperparameter tuning. How do we, you know, what are what are the what are the uh, solutions that we can we should consider? What are the approaches that we should consider right before we employ or even try to develop AI models? If we know the framework and the restrictions that we are working within, then there may be things that we can do in advance of time before we are too down deep into the solution making process. Um, there are other things that need to be called out in the de-risk AI model space. 
the model bias. What are what are model bias? How do we address model bias? How do we correct data bias? How do we correct label bias? How do we ensure that what are the you know what are some of the things that we can do using challengers model to 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 identify you know and be aware of uh, some of the bias and what are the algorithms that we can use to to make sure that we can we can call out and identify and be aware of these and some of the bias aware algorithms that we can we can all try out on dynamic model calibration, what are some of the challenges with the reinforcement learning around model parameter modification on, on, on run, at runtime? What are some of the things that we need to do to ensure that if we do that, then model validation or model management risk are, are, are addressed? Um, lastly, I will be talking about some of the current trend observed in the word embedding space. Um, this is this is very important for people who are focusing and using natural language processing to do embedding work um, using um, you know, language models. Some of the current trends, existing things that, you know, traditional things that we do versus the, the new trend and what has been, what has we, what have we observed in the new trend and what are some of the, the key components and differences and challenges as well as um, the, the champions in the space. So that is, that wraps up my, um, my All right, uh, so I'm going to be uh, talking in, in, in my talk about methods for unsupervised modeling of data and artificial intelligence. Um, let me say that it's clear from the, the, the previous three distinguished speakers how important uh, artificial intelligence is. Certainly, and whenever I've gone out and talked to industries, everybody feels that uh, it's, uh, it's an existential question for them. As someone mentioned, though, they're not quite all adopting yet, but they all know they're going to at some point in the, in the, in the near future. Um, now, so let me, let's talk a little bit about artificial intelligence. As I say, it's obviously an area of huge importance everywhere. Um, but for people of my generation, and to give you an idea, I'm, I'm a little older. I'm, I was born in the 50s. Um, when, we, when I first heard about artificial intelligence, it was thought of as replacing tasks that humans already do, <clears throat> but perhaps don't want to do anymore or don't do effectively uh, or don't do quickly enough. Um, but where there was already a human pattern for the solution of the problem. So they had already understood that, that uh, uh, how to do it, and it was just a question of automating that. Now what we're seeing now in this, and I think this is perhaps the third iteration on artificial intelligence, uh, um, is that now we're, what we're trying to do is to solve problems that humans can't really solve or can't solve well because of their size uh, and, and their complexity. Um, <clears throat> what that means is that there is no longer a, a, um, a, a template for the solution that a human has created. And so what that means is it brings up a lot of new things that have to be done. So it means we need to solve problems without the human template. And uh, what that means is we need to understand and model very large and very complex data sets. The data is much more complicated than what, than, than what we've dealt with before, and it, it's also much, much larger. Um, the other thing is that we need to do it in what I would call an unsupervised or an unbiased way. Um, you know, one of the things uh, <clears throat> about the humans is we have uh, this notion of confirmation bias. And confirmation bias is that we typically we we're very we're a very clever species, and so we are able to uh, generate lots of theories and lots of hypotheses. The downside to that is that oftentimes we like those hypotheses uh, and theories a little too much, and so we'll tend to want to make the data fit to those hypotheses rather than really understanding um, in an unbiased and unsupervised and unplanned way. Uh, what is actually in the data. Um, and, and here's an interesting thing also. What many of the algorithms that come up in machine learning and specifically in deep learning, uh, you know, are very, very large and complex. And uh, they're not very transparent. It's not very easy to understand what's going on in them. And I think that uh, limits the adoption, frankly. Um, so, uh, sometimes these algorithms, though, can be viewed, a way to understand them is to treat them themselves 
as a data problem. So because they are so big, the, the internal state of the machines can be viewed as a source of data and analyzing and understanding that data gives us transparency and allows us to understand what's going on underneath the hood. That's important for many situations. Wherever there's a regulatory situation, people are, are typically hesitant to adopt uh, you know, algorithms and models that we don't understand what they're, what they're doing. Uh, it's also true that any automatic thing ultimately is going to break down at some point, and we don't want to just have the information that, yes, it broke down. We'd like to understand why did it break down and how can we fix it. So all these things, what, I want to, what I'm going to describe in my talk is a way of trying to understand in a better way uh, these large and complex data sets, perhaps generated by the algorithms, um, and, uh, and, and get information and understanding out of them. So to give you a, a sense of it here, mathematical modeling, uh, the, as we think of it, is usually in terms of equations. And I certainly always have thought of it in those terms. I'm a mathematician by training. Uh, what, that, what those theories uh, or these algebraic models typically give you is uh, they give you really great understanding in situations where the data is relatively simple, where there are a small number of variables and a small number of relationships among those variables. So that is what I would call uh, algebraic modeling of, uh, uh, of, of, of data sets. It's not very, it's not adequate, unfortunately, it, it, for the, most of the data that's coming in. If you think about data about fraud or financial transactions, or you know, even in the life sciences area of genomics with you know, very large uh, amounts of data being collected. All that data is so complicated and complex, and it's not very well suited to this kind of simple algebraic modeling. But nevertheless, we want to get understanding out of it. And so what I'll be telling you about in, in, in the talk is a different kind of modeling. It's what we would call uh, shape modeling or topological modeling of, of data. The output is no longer a set of equations, but it's a network. And to just give you a quick idea of it, here's one example where it has been applied to study um, type 2 diabetes. Uh, type 2 diabetes is uh, you know, one of the fastest growing diseases in the, in the uh, in, in first world and indeed worldwide. Um, <clears throat> and so in this case, it has been thought of as a single disease. And that limits the degree to which you can treat it because it turns out that, as is shown in this model here, so this model is a, is a uh, model of a data set of 11,000 type 2 diabetics. And you can see that it really breaks up into three distinct pieces um, uh, connected by thin wires. Uh, and it turns out that these pieces correspond to really different forms of the disease, in fact, different diseases. One of them is heavily correlated with cancer. Another is very heavily correlated with neurological symptoms and so forth. Um, and so if you want to do, say, artificial intelligence on recommending treatments for diabetes, or if you frankly, even if you're a pharmaceutical company and you want to develop drugs, you don't want to develop it for all type 2 diabetics. You want to develop it for the individual types uh, separately because you'll have much more uh, effectiveness that way. So that is, uh, this is just a, a hint. I'll talk a lot about a lot more of, uh, you, you know, this kind of analysis where the output of the model is, uh, is, uh, is a network instead of a set of equations. And just to, to finish up, um, neural networks um, are an example of the kind of algorithm that I mentioned before that's very hard to get transparency into. You know, it works beautifully in many situations. Uh, oftentimes there's there's a fair amount of overfitting going on, uh, but nevertheless, obviously a very effective uh, method, uh, but it's very hard to understand what's going on inside. And so one can build data sets of, of so-called activations and uh, weights within these, within these networks, build these data sets and study them, and therefore get understanding of what's going on inside the neural network. The ultimate goal here is to make them as transparent as the algebraic modeling is, but to have it apply in these very much more uh, complex situations. So in my talk, I'm going to describe for you this method of topological modeling with uh, you know, lots, lots of examples, including some examples where we show exactly what's going on in the process of learning 
uh, for convolutional neural networks, which deal with uh, with images. Um, so uh, you, you know, hopefully that will be interesting, and I look forward to seeing people in the audience in August. Thank you very.